Great. Okay, so welcome back everyone to the second session of uh, the Bulges 2022 conference. So we are continuing with two more review talks in this session. So we're going to be spanning the very high red shifts and we'll also go uh, very local. So we're going to be hearing about um, clumpy disks and their relation to bulge formation. And then we'll be hearing about the properties of the Milky Way's bulge. So some housekeeping before we get going. So we remind you that we have a code of conduct like all ESO meetings, and this is in the quick links in the uh, ESO Bulges 2022 webpage. So if there's any uh, breach of the code of conduct, please uh, reach out to Elena Valenti or Dimitri Gadotti. Um, as you have seen, the, the sessions are being recorded. So if people don't want to appear in the recordings, please keep your camera and your microphone off um, and write any questions you might have on the chat. And we'll be uh, taking questions to the speakers at the end of their talks. Um, so you can either raise your hand and then you will uh, unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, of course, feel free to turn on your video if you want also. You can either write it in the chat here on Zoom or in the Slack channel. And if anyone is not yet on Slack, um, please uh, do come join. There's a lot of active discussion happening there. Um, so yeah, so we'll continue now with our review talks. So the first talk is from Stein Wutz. I'm sorry, I didn't say that properly, but uh, <laughs> sorry about that. And uh, who will tell us about higher shift clumpy disks and what these can tell us about bulge formation from observations. So Stein, I will give you a three minute uh, warning at the end of your time. So please feel free to share your screen and take it away. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by, by thanking the organizers for, for putting together this program and uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to present this review on the nature of star forming galaxies at high redshift, clumpy disks. Um, on occasion, I'll broaden the scope a little bit uh, in terms of redshift range and uh, incorporating some of uh, lessons on quiescent galaxies as well. So a lot of this progress that we've made over the, the past decade or so has been pushed by HST observations as well as IFU observations from the ground and increasingly ALMA. And uh, this conference now comes at a nice time uh, because we're all gearing up to JWST, uh, but also given that it's an ESO organized conference, um, uh, at the VLT recently, there was the commissioning of the IRIS IFU spectrograph, which enhances sensitivity, spatial and spectral resolution uh, compared to previous generation IFUs. So it's a good time to take stock of what we've learned. And uh, partly that can be cast in the form of scaling relations for star forming galaxies that describe their physical characteristics as a function of mass and redshift, uh, starting with the, the, the main sequence of star forming galaxies, tightness of which has been uh, uh, an inspiration to pictures of more equilibrium growth of galaxies rather than a merger driven growth picture. Um, also a census of the amount of cold gas available for star formation, uh, the degree of rotational support, how uh, that varies with mass and redshift, the level of chemical enrichment, uh, as well as structural measures, uh, surface density and the size. And if you, if you pair these scaling relations with a census of how many galaxies there are at each given epoch and mass, and how many of them are star forming, that gives a nice comprehensive picture of the evolving galaxy population since cosmic noon. Um, but one thing that it, it doesn't portray, at least not in a direct way, is what the uh, evolutionary tracks of individual galaxies look like. Now, one approach to addressing that question has been to assume that over time, mass ranking of galaxies is conserved. We can then connect galaxies that live at the same number density at different epochs and reconstruct a typical mass growth curve 
of, say, a galaxy ending up with Milky Way mass today. And there have been corrections and refinements of this technique. But if you take one of these mass growth curves and you pair it with the previously presented scaling relations, you can then get a ballpark picture of a Milky Way mass progenitor or the progenitor of a Milky Way mass galaxy and how it built up its stellar mass over time, how it relatively rapidly enriched its ISM, and how, for example, the angular momentum content comparatively took a long time to build up. And so for this Milky Way mass progenitor, uh, contrasted against the backdrop of the redshift two main sequence relation, an evolutionary track would look roughly as follows. Um, surely one can debate to which degree any individual Milky Way mass progenitor would follow a track that way or would deviate from it. Um, and if you do the same exercise for a more massive system, you would find it climbing up all the way to the tip of the main sequence around 10 to the 11 solar masses already at redshift two, at which point it should be uh, quenching imminently. Now, this is mostly considering galaxies as kind of zero dimensional systems. And so if we really want to understand the physics behind these evolutionary tracks, we want to understand and dissect them at a spatially resolved level and ideally with a multitude of traces. So in this slide, you see an ideal example, a redshift two galaxy, star forming galaxy, for which there is a mapping of the REST UV and H alpha emission powered by star formation, the molecular gas reservoirs fuel for star formation with ALMA, longer wavelength HST imaging, which is not just probing the youngest and least obscured populations of stars, and from the color distribution, reconstructed stellar mass distributions. And what the IFU observations add to that is a picture of the dynamical support, but also signatures of feedback in action. This is still a rare case where you have this collection for one given galaxy, uh, but if you consider any of these traces individually, the sample sizes have increased tremendously and we can look into population trends. And the different characteristics that I will discuss include the kinematics, the clumpy nature, the stellar and star formation rate distributions. Uh, and I'll end off with some words on the intrinsic 3D shapes. So it's well established that in terms of kinematic nature, the ordered disk rotation, velocity gradients in the better quality data cubes, spider diagrams are the norm, uh, also at cosmic noon. Uh, but that does not to say that their kinematic makeup mimics that of Milky Way type spirals today. Um, in this study by Hannah Hübler, you see that, that local random motions are found to uh, be more prominent um, uh, higher in amplitude among redshift two star forming disks than in the nearby universe. And mimicking that same trend, uh, but still with smaller sample sizes, you see equally with a small offset an increase in local random motions measured in colder gas phases. And if you contrast that to the degree of rotational motion, you find that a fraction of galaxies with a V over sigma exceeding unity is a function of both mass and redshift. Uh, it's such that at any epoch, the most massive galaxies tend to be the most settled in their disk configuration. And as time progresses, you also find this V over sigma uh, diagnostic to go up. So that has been referred to as, as disk settling. Now, beyond the nature of, of, of disks, uh, one can use that disk framework then to do a dynamical modeling and constrain the mass budget in the visible extent of these, these galaxies. And one finds that the dark matter fractions uh, quantified within RE are showing the strongest trend with the surface density of baryons. And at redshift two star forming galaxies occupy predominantly this higher surface density end. 
Um, that is the location where in the local universe, you find more the early type rather than late type galaxy population. Uh, but note that thinking back about these progenitor descendant sequences, the early type galaxies today are actually the more likely descendants of these star forming galaxies kinematically mapped at redshift two. There are also quiescent galaxies for which, you know, they're already quenched at high redshifts and stellar kinematics enabled uh, thinning down the dark matter fraction within them. They have yet smaller dark matter fractions in their inner regions. And um, that points at a very dissipative formation mechanism. Somehow the um, baryons managed to concentrate very much in the center, making up this baryon dominated uh, compact system. Now there are a few caveats. Um, one is that when comparing these kind of mass budget assessments between different samples, uh, one should obviously compare them within the same aperture and within RE that is established most reliably at larger, within larger apertures, um, one tends to become more sensitive to, to priors in the modeling. Um, depth is an important factor um, because you want to probe also the kinematics at outer radii where the galaxy disk is faint. Um, but at these outer radii, the impact of pressure support also becomes quite important to account for. Um, if there's presence of non-circular motions that can complicate the interpretation, but if you turn it around and you look ahead at higher sensitivity, higher resolution data sets, uh, it also offers an opportunity uh, because these non-circular motions may give us a, a, a view directly of uh, the processes leading to bulge formation. Now, not all motions are probing the gravitational potential. Uh, you have brought wings to emission line profiles, and uh, they are signaling gas being expelled at large velocities from galaxies. Um, among those galaxies that do not feature active nuclei, that uh, kind of wind signature is seen most prominently above the star forming main sequence. Among galaxies that do have uh, AGN, these uh, powerful winds are predominantly present at a mass event. And with adaptive optics, one can pinpoint where within the galaxies these winds are launched. Uh, the star forming winds predominantly at the sides of off center star forming clumps, whereas the nuclear uh, winds are corresponding to those galaxies with AGN signatures. Now, increasingly, this kind of studies are moving from a characterization of the, the incidence of outflows to establishing scaling relations, outflow scaling relations that parameterize the, the strength of the outflows, mass flow rates and velocities as a function of the drivers, the star formation rate, the AGM luminosity and other internal galaxy properties, the galaxy mass and size. Um, and uh, there are local benchmarks that already do this for larger samples on an individual object basis for nearby uh, galaxies where the winds are much more gentle and often not escaping, but uh, in the form of a phantom. Now, one comment I want to make though, is that um, one of the, the biggest limitations at this stage of probing that feedback is um, that the traces used are predominantly the ionized gas phase and uh, both from nearby samples and from uh, a few higher redshift uh, observations, uh, it's clear that this may uh, represent just a small fraction of the total outflowing mass budget. And so uh, multi-phase traces is, is, is one avenue in which this field will progress. Um, I, I mentioned turbulent baryon dominated disks with ubiquitous outflows, some of these outflows being launched at the sides of off-center clumps. So I'd like to discuss in a bit more depth this clumpy nature, which was first established based on the REST UV and H alpha imaging. Um, and uh, then it's really with the installment of WIFC3 
uh, treasury programs with HST such as candles that allowed for clumps in large galaxy samples to take an approach of resolved SED modeling and um, get to uh, the, the nature of these clumpy features. Uh, first, the incidence, so what fraction of galaxies, of star forming galaxies, is clumpy. Uh, there, there is this work uh, from Yusheng Guo, which showed that um, at low masses, this fraction is high uh, over a wide range and remains high over a wide range of redshifts. Whereas, if you consider the more massive star forming galaxies, as time progresses, the fraction of galaxies that appears clumpy like that um, is dropping sensitively. In terms of their internal properties, um, both blue colors and H alpha equivalent widths have indicated that their mass to light ratios are low. Um, that's attributed to enhanced specific star formation rates, young ages, but young relative to the underlying disk at least. And um, it's important to emphasize that it's not just variations in stellar population. There are also variations spatially in dust attenuation. Uh, one diagnostic signaling that is that these UV clumps have overall lower H alpha of UV ratios than the underlying disk. So one can quantify what contribution do they make to the overall UV light uh, from star forming galaxies. Um, it's, it's modest. Uh, it's once accounting for spatial variations in dust attenuation. It's uh, somewhat smaller in terms of contribution to the star formation rate, and it's yet smaller in contribution to the stellar mass. We can compare some of these contributions quantified in different papers from the literature, um, illustrating the trend I described, uh, but also illustrating variations between these uh, different results. Um, and that can be, um, upon a closer look, attributed to sample differences spanning a different redshift or mass range, um, the selection band or tracer, H alpha or UV that's used to identify the clumps, uh, but also technical aspects, whether or not and how uh, underlying diffuse component uh, was subtracted in identifying the uh, and measuring the clump properties and down to which detection threshold uh, clumps were identified. And obviously uh, these contributions also differ when one compares it relative to the overall star forming galaxy population or just to the UV light or the star formation rate in clumpy uh, disks. Now, uh, one, one paper still on the incidence of clumpy galaxies that I wanted to highlight, a recent one, is in fact not based on HST imaging, uh, but ground-based imaging, where uh, a finite resolution deconvolution was applied to uh, bring the 0.7 arc second image quality data to a target 0.3 arc second resolution, still modest compared to HST, but when comparing this middle deconvolved column to the right HST images available for the same galaxy, um, you, you, you find that uh, there is a reasonable match. And the benefit is that this opens uh, a door to uh, much larger sample statistics. And so doing so, these authors um, show how from redshift to half to redshift two, the fraction of galaxies that appears clumpy is increasing, uh, how it depends on whether the clumps are identified at short wavelengths, longer wavelengths, or in the stellar mass distribution. And it is a function also of uh, the mass of the galaxy with a larger fraction of clumpy galaxies at the low mass end. Uh, perhaps more importantly uh, is, uh, or going to the physics is uh, the, the formation and fate of these clumps. And here are a few papers I wanted to flag. Um, one of them uh, indicating a population of very young clumps. Uh, more of them have been found since where the equivalent width is so high that the associated age tells you um, the formation must have happened in situ via gravitational collapse. Um, 
In terms of fate, the longevity is an important parameter. Uh, looking at simulations, you may need only 100 to 200 million years for these clumps to migrate inwards, contribute to bulge formation. But other simulations that implement strong feedback are capable of disrupting these clumps on a few tens of million year time scale. Um, and uh, therefore, it's, it's, it's an interesting question to, to see what empirically that can be constrained about their longevity. Um, and these studies listed here uh, arrive at an answer that at least uh, a subset of these uh, observed clumps uh, would survive long enough to participate in this migration picture. And it, is, it would be then this um, uh, migration that is responsible for the observed gradients in clump color, age, specific star formation rate, and uh, for the fact that these gradients are steeper than similar gradients seen for the diffuse component of the underlying disk. Um, one perhaps underemphasized aspect of these clumps is uh, the perspective from cold gas diagnostics, CO and uh, dust continuum, where in fact, uh, these off-center clumps are not observed so much as a phenomenon, uh, let alone that the dust continuum would identify the same clump locations that are seen in UV. Instead, the dust continuum structures um, observed at high resolution often are very compact cores, one to two kiloparsec size in the centers of galaxies. And where there were reports of uh, clumps in the dust continuum, there's also a lesson to be learned on the importance of observational depth. Uh, here you see illustrated um, that this is uh, already benefiting from the luxury of lensing magnification. But on the right, you see a deeper integration on the cosmic eyelash uh, reveals a perfectly smooth diffuse dust continuum component, um, whereas a shallower older integration on the same source uh, was used to make inferences on a series of clumps and uh, are, are in this new study attributed to um, clean algorithm basically amplifying uh, noise peaks in shallow data. Uh, you may have noted that so far, I, I have not uh, said much about absolute properties of the clumps, the sizes, the masses. Uh, here, lens studies have uh, introduced a new perspective where um, the message has been that uh, HST may be inadequate to uh, properly characterize the extent of the clumps uh, in the sense that as one looks at uh, areas with higher lensing magnification, one finds smaller and ever smaller star forming clumps. In mass, there is some trend with magnification, but there's also a secondary, uh, a more important effect that as one probes down to fainter UV magnitudes, uh, you pick up lower mass clumps. And so that's this effect of detection threshold being of importance. And so one question that I'd be interested to hear more about uh, throughout this week is um, whether this changes the overall picture um, or whether this hierarchical fragmentation down at scales smaller than the tumor scale is in fact what one would expect theoretically uh, also in this picture of uh, gravitational collapse um, uh, due to the, the, the marginal stable nature of these gas rich disks. Now, um, stepping away from clumps and looking at properties uh, in terms of radial profiles, these spatial variations in color and mass to light ratio also have an impact of global quantities, global quantities such as the bulge prominence and the size. So what you see in the top uh, middle panel is the red centeredness, uh, color in the inner within two kiloparsec aperture minus the color outside uh, for star forming and quiescent galaxies at redshift one and two. And uh, all of these populations have negative color gradients, 
but the steepest color gradients, they are found in star forming galaxies at the mass event at late times. And because this red centeredness varies between galaxy types, um, there are implications when propagating this to both the total ratios and sizes. Quantified on stellar mass distributions, the both the total ratio of star forming galaxies at the high mass end conveys that already a very significant fraction of stars is present in a bulge component prior to the shutdown of star formation. And the implication for the size evolution is that, uh, first of all, the size mass relation quantified from mass maps is much shallower than what one quantifies from the rest optical light. And between redshift two and a half and one, there is a much more modest size evolution, again, than one would infer from light. Uh, additional perspective on size growth is to evaluate instantaneously where are stars forming within galaxies. And first attempts to do so, um, we're concentrating on the H alpha equivalent width as a proxy for a specific star formation and found based on this GRISM spectroscopy, uh, which, which allows you to extract H-alpha maps at HST resolution, found central depressions in the H-alpha equivalent width, uh, particularly at higher masses. Now, the caveat here is that uh, there are spatial dust variations, and whether you quantify it using Balmer decrement, UV slopes, or resolved SED modeling, you always find that these dust gradients or attenuation gradients or negative. And so the equivalent width is in fact not a dust insensitive tracer because the nebular emission may be subject to additional attenuation from dust in bird clouds. So once accounting for that, Sandro Takella for a sample of Redshift 2 star forming galaxies concluded the specific star formation rate profiles are rather flat except at the highest masses above 10 to 11 solar masses, where you still find this central depression, so signature of inside out quenching. Now, um, that is the picture from H alpha and dust corrected H alpha. Uh, we can also look at the far infrared, and that's where I mentioned earlier, these very compact dust continuum cores are present. Sizes that are a factor two or three smaller than the rest optical, smaller also than the sizes of the stellar mass distribution. And so um, given that these galaxies at the mass event at Redshift 2 have more than 90% of their star formation obscured behind dust, this may actually be what probes the, where bulk of star formation is taking place which means that prior to switching off, we see bulge formation in action. It may not be enough to just divide the star forming galaxies in different mass bins. Um, there are differences in star formation profiles when one moves from below to on and above the main sequence. Um, Zero order, there is in the general amplitude an increase in star formation across our radii when you move to uh, more star bursting types. But uh, you can also see there's a difference in slope so that above main sequence galaxies have, especially in the center, an increase in their star formation activity. Um, from the colored profiles, you can further appreciate that with the more localized implementation of AGM feedback in TNG, um, the observed profiles are better reproduced than in precursor simulations of illustries, where uh, the energy from uh, AGM feedback was dumped over a much larger spatial scale. As JWST instruments are being calibrated, we look forward to uh, the MIRCAM GRISM, which uh, will will do two things in this context of star formation profiles. First of all, it will open a window via Balmer lines on the um, distribution of star formation within galaxies into the epoch of reionization. But also at cosmic noon, it will offer us 
a more dust insensitive probe of star formation at high resolution with the passion lights. So that's like something to look forward to uh, in terms of this star formation rate profiles. Uh, that leaves me with uh, last theme, 3D shapes that I wanted to address. Um, and here the answer is basically that um, if you have a sizable galaxy sample that is complete, and uh, can be treated as an ensemble viewed from random viewing angles, the, infer the, the projected actual ratio distribution uh, can be inverted to give you the mixture of intrinsic 3D shapes, so intrinsic actual ratios. And that's exactly what um, was done in this paper on star forming galaxies in candles, uh, confirming earlier results on an increased prominence of elongated prolate shapes as one looks at higher redshifts and low masses. And so it's in this low mass regime, especially at higher redshift, that our picture of axisymmetric disks may, may break down. A similar analysis uh, was recently also carried out on half a million galaxies, quiescent galaxies in this case, spanning the last half of cosmic history, finding that over all these redshifts are 2.9, um, above 10 to 11 solar masses, you see a characteristic change in the actual ratio distribution. Um, this is the same trend broken down in mass and redshift bins. And at the highest masses, shapes are rounder, even uh, up to redshift 0.9. In fact, uh, in following of this earlier paper analyzing star forming galaxies, the modeling is best done not of 1D actual ratio distributions, but in the plane of axis ratio and projected size. Um, and doing so, from the observations, you can recover the breakdown in shape families uh, with this upturn uh, of spheroidal fractions in the observations as one goes to the high mass end. A similar upturn from intermediate to high masses is seen in TNG. Um, but the simulated galaxies at low masses, um, there we see striking differences with the observations. And even at intermediate masses, there is uh, a, a trend that uh, the simulated quiescent galaxies um, are, are, are much more often favoring these elongated prolate shapes. Um, Stein, three minutes. Yes. Um, the upturn uh, towards round shapes uh, in TNG is associated with an increase in ex situ fractions. Um, and uh, so also the observational trend here is plausibly interpreted as, as mergers being responsible. And in fact, uh, in the observations, there are environmental differentiations seen such that even when carrying out precise mass matching uh, in the overdense regime, you find the roundest systems, um, uh, which again can be attributed to a, a richer merger history. Um, you may notice here that uh, in TNG, the roundest uh, galaxies are the ones with the highest dodge to total ratios. In the observations, likewise, when selecting pure bulge galaxies based on their 2D surface brightness profiles in their intrinsic shapes, they are also dominated by this uh, spheroid population. Now, at redshifts above one out to redshifts three or so, um, the numbers of quiescent galaxies for which these shape measurements can be done is much smaller. So it's often based on inferences on the median actual ratio rather than the detailed modeling of the distribution. Uh, but there were uh, a number of papers uh, that claimed to see flatter quiescent galaxies at high redshift, also with lower Cersic indices. So occupying more this low end of a uh, 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 mass and redshift independent relation between projected actual ratio and Cersic index. Um, however, when you compile a larger cross section of the literature, uh, this trend becomes a bit more muddled. And uh, this particular work by Lustig cautions that uh, there may be some contamination in photometric quiescent galaxy samples 
from uh, just reddened edge-on star forming disks. And in fact, they, for a sample of spectroscopically confirmed Bison systems, where you really see the Balmer break in the spectrum, uh, find cystic indices and actual ratios as high as uh, uh, typical for nearby early type galaxies. So with that, I arrive at a uh, summary. So I, I, I described first um, the vigorous lives of high redshift star forming galaxies, uh, how at the mass event, the settled disks are emerging first, and how at the low mass end, they may not even be disks. Um, the clumpiness, which is prominent in REST UV and H alpha, um, makes up for an overall modest contribution to star formation, yet lower to the stellar mass. And uh, in terms of cold ISM traces, it's more the compact dust cores that dominate um, and uh, the uh, off-center clumps are, are not so much present there. I emphasize that it's not just variations in stellar population, also in dust attenuation. And uh, there are some exciting new diagnostics that we will be able to use uh, to address and, and, and advance that further. And finally, if you combine these 2D uh, surface brightness profiles with actual ratio distributions, um, one can get nice uh, constraints on shape and structure uh, of galaxies, but at redshifts above two, as of yet, there's not yet uh, a converged result on the disk versus bulge nature of quiescent galaxies. So um, I will leave up here a slide with open questions, some of which follow directly from the talk, others venture a bit further, but I hope they inspire some further discussion later in the week. Thank you. Thank you, Stein. So let's um, take any uh, questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please either raise your hand or um, write it in the chat. Okay, so maybe I take the prerogative. Ah, no, okay. We have a question from uh, Dimitri. Go ahead, Dimitri. Um, hi, Stein. Thanks a lot for the for the thorough of um, review. So I was just thinking once when when you show the plot with the masses of the of the clumps, um, most of them. I mean, the, the 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 upper limit. It's something like a few times ten to the nine, if I saw correctly. Um, and I was thinking, then you know, maybe in the local universe we can have some some central spheroids um, that are a few times 10 to the 10. And, and then I was wondering if, if what, what, what is your thought on, on a limit of how massive the bulge that is formed by, by clumps can be um, formed via clump coalescence? Um, if, 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 for example, we cannot explain only with clump coalescence, the formation of the most massive bulges we observe uh, in the local universe. Yeah. Um, I, well, first of all, I, I, I think that um, uh, the clumps and their contribution to bulge formation is, is, uh, is not just a matter of bringing in the stars in these clumps uh, by itself, uh, but this, deviations from axis symmetry in the presence in the form of clumps can also induce inflow of gas. Uh, and so that, that may further contribute to belch formation, not in the presence of star stellar migration. Uh, also, uh, at any given moment in a given galaxy, there may only be a few clumps and they may not add up to a, a lot of mass, um, but uh, their migration may only be requiring uh, a, li a little more than an orbital time scale, a few orbital time scales. So over time, um, so the, the instantaneous picture adding up those clumps will not make up the mass that you need to build a bulge, but over time it may be more significant. Right, okay, thanks. So maybe I'll just take the prerogative of chair and building up on, on Dimitri's question. So you say that the buildup of, um, the bulges can happen from the buildup of these clumps spiraling inwards over time. But if the 
I mean, again, let's say these makeup in terms of mass these are very negligible components, right? So can we really still build the massive bulges um, that we see in, in low redshift galaxies? And also how does the destruction of these structures from feedback, for example, does that not play a role as well? Can we say something about this? Yeah, so um, I, I, I think uh, at least in, in, in some of the, the more recent uh, theoretical work, uh, there, is a, there is both an influx and an outgoing flux of material with this clump. So they, they're not seen as static structures, there's partially disruption uh, aided by these outflows we see coming from clumps. Um, but additionally, there is material feeding in. So there is, for example, a, a recent uh, paper by, by Avishai Dekel that in fact applies a, a gas regulator model that has been frequently adopted to model galaxies as a whole to the context of you know, individual clumps where um, this complicates a bit the picture of interpreting the observations because in observations you're often you know looking at probes of the stellar population but if if stars get stripped out and gas comes in building younger stars it it's um uh it, it makes it a bit more difficult to put constraints empirically on longevity so uh the way for example anita zanella has done it is to uh to compare the total number of clumps to the number of very young clumps where very young can be then assessed based on high equivalent widths mm -hmm. uh, and that can give you some picture of uh, rate at which clumps are formed and 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 their their typical lifetimes um, okay thanks so martin Bureau has a question yeah thank you starting for a great overview i just wanted to come back to the dark matter fraction trends that you had and really just ask honestly how much we can trust these fractions, especially given that, you know, at the bottom of your plot, you had a whole bunch of galaxies with a fraction of zero, which presumably mean in practice, you had a luminous mass greater than a dynamical mass of, you know, which is physically impossible. So, you know, how much can we really trust those? Yeah, no, that's uh, uh, a good point. I, I, I think, um, uh, first of all, I, I, I think the the existence of a, a strong trend with baryonic surface density that is uh, that is the most robust uh, result, and the uh, and the scaling is uh, is is more difficult. Although um, uh, uh, Sedona Price has has uh, done a recent analysis of different measurement methodologies and it's, it's uh, how it propagates to this parameter of dark matter fraction. And, uh, and, and the overall conclusion are, is actually fairly robust there. So the, the results you show were combining two types of analysis. One was an analysis which back in 2016 I did where it's comparing from the kinematic side, just dynamical masses and it's comparing that to independent measurements from of the gas and stars, um, where of course you suffer from uncertainties in you know, the determination of stellar masses and so on. Then there were other measurements shown there, which are entirely dynamically determined by basically decomposing the rotation curve. Um, when doing that, uh, there, um, some some priors are are placed on uh, on the dark matter. So so the empirical constraints come within the visible extent, right? Only where there is light. Uh, from abundance matching, you only have some prior on the gallic, the halo mass on much larger scales, and um, and so uh, you can look with a conventional dark matter profile. Uh, does that explain the contributions of dark matter in the center. And, um, and there's some uh, indications that with a NFW profile and, and a typical uh, concentration of the halo, um, you actually uh, get too much dark matter. 
um, and, uh, and you may need a more court dark matter halo profile. Um, that said, there are uh, cases where, particularly at lower masses, where you hit that regime of um, basically uh, wanting zero dark matter. And um, because it appears more frequently at the lowest mass, is I, uh, I'm wondering there whether if indeed the whole ansatz of axisymmetry breaks down because shapes are more prolate, maybe the, the framework in which the dynamical modeling is done is not appropriate. And so there must be some regime where maybe transitioning to a virial mass estimator is better. I, I'm not sure you, you probably know better how to model such systems, um, but at least at the mass events, I think different approaches uh, seem, seem to arrive at this, uh, this trend with surface uh, baryonic surface density and, and the overall uh, low dark matter fraction when quantified within RE. When quantified within two or three RE, the dark matter fraction increases, of course. Thank you. So I think Daniel also, Daniel Severino had a question. Uh, do you still want to ask your question, Daniel? No, I guess he said it was a comment on a previous question. Ah, okay, great, great. Okay, are there any more questions? So if not, I remind you to, if, if you don't wanna ask a question now, we can continue this on, on Slack. And of course, in the discussion sessions in the rest of the week. Uh, so please uh, think of your questions, keep them coming. And um, we'll keep discussing clumps at high red shifts throughout the week. So thanks very much Stein for the nice talk. And now we can move on with the next talk, which is Manuela Zoccoli who's gonna be telling us about the, uh, giving us an overview of the observational properties of the Milky Way bulge. So Maluena, I think you can share your screen and unmute yourself. Great, so we can- Hello, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So I also want to thank the organizers to, for invite to have me here. I must say I would have loved to personally hug a few of you, but given that it's not possible, I am especially grateful for the format you chose that is very convenient for all of us, even in different time zones. So for the observational properties of the galactic bulge, I would like to start with the stellar mass, just to make the point that the bulge is massive. Um, some, I list here some of the recent determinations of the bulge stellar mass that are two, maybe 1.5, maybe 2.4, time 10 to the 10 solar masses. Compared to the mass of the disk that here in this review is quoted as four time 10 to the 10, um, solar masses, other authors um, quote more six times 10 to the 10 solar masses, but mostly the bulge is at least one third of the mass of the disk. And that means that uh, its formation is not marginal in the context of the formation of the galaxy. I must say that these numbers agree pretty well, in my opinion, uh, for an astrophysics but also the discrepancies between them um, are mainly due to the different definition of the bulge uh, limits that are of course not sharp, not very well defined. Among those determinations, I would like to draw your attention to this one because it is ours. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Uh, this number, this number here may or may not be more accurate than the others. Um, this is not my point here. What I want to uh, highlight is the fact that this was derived by counting red clump stars. Yes, one by one. This is something that we are able to do now in our own bulge. Uh, and is, it is what makes it unique in the context of um, extragalactic bulges. Given that we can count stars individually, 
We can do that at any specific line of sight and in a field as big or as small as we want. So we can construct stellar density profiles at every position and of course stellar mass profiles at every position. In case you want to play yourself the game of county stars, you are very welcome to do that because there is a, a public stellar catalog based on PSF photometry, including completeness and reddening in the near infrared. And it is available from the ISO archive. It was made by Francisco Zurot and Elena Valenti at ISO. Moving now to the 3D structure of our own bulge. Just like Paula, I start this chapter with uh, an artistic image of um, our own galaxy seen face on. This is from a recent review by Shannon Zhang. And I chose this one just to point that uh, we know very well that in the center of our galaxy, there is a bar. We actually have been knowing that since the 60s from the Vaucular. And then many other authors have um, studied it and characterized it. It was uh, first identified as an asymmetry in the near infrared um, map of the, in the region of the galaxy. We see that this is boxy as we will see, but the um, left side is larger than the right side. And we now know that this is because the left side is uh, closer, is the close edge of the bulge of the bar. But now that we can count stars one by one, we can use red clump stars to really uh, deproject the 3D structure of the bulge. We use in particular red clump stars because we know that um, their magnitudes, their magnitude has very little dependence on metallicity and age. And so we can assume um, at least to the first order that their magnitude can be related to their distance. And so we study their magnitude distribution at different line of sight and can reconstruct the 3D shape. I chose, I particularly like this one figure, which is from a paper by Weg and Gerard, but really many different authors have used the um, star counts, in particular the near infrared ones that are not so sensitive to reddening to derive the parameters of the bar and they show a pretty reasonable agreement on the axis ratio on the semi-major axis that is a bit smaller than one kiloparsec. And uh, this semi-major axis has an inclination and angle with the sun galactic center line of sight of the order of 20, 30 degrees and this pattern speed. So um, in the outer part, in its outer part, the main bar has what we call boxy peanut or sometime X shape, which is this structure here. The extra galactic people know very well. I don't need to explain what that is, but it was the X shape. This thing was uh, mm, originally identified uh, by means of the, of the fact that the red clump stars have a clear B modalities in some line of sight. I just draw one of them as an example, and we see that some line of sight cross two over densities, one here and another there. Again, many different people have characterized and parametrized this shape. On in the plane, very close to the plane, but extending far away toward the disk, the main bar has this other structure that is known as the thin long bar. It gets to more or less five kiloparsec on each side. And it is it has been um, parametrized, for instance, by Wag and collaborator in 2015. Now, these three things, the thin long bar, the main bar in the middle, and the boxy peanut shape are part of one structure that has been formed by one single dynamical process from the disk. Um, Paola Di Matteo has explained this very well, but it was not, this process was known already from 20 years ago. Patsis and Lia Odonasula had shown that when you form a bar in the middle of the galaxy, in some condition, the orbits of the stars in the innermost region bend 
start bending, forming this uh, complex uh, pattern that sustains this papillon shape that is then a single structure that resembles um, impressively well the structure at the center of our galaxy. So, so far, one might think that we know how the bulge is and we know very well since a long time, how did it form? Of course, that's not the case. In fact, one of the reasons why it is more complicated than that is the fact that if we construct the metallicity distribution, we see that it is bimodal. It is everywhere bimodal, but the ratio of the two components changes with latitude. I put this figure here because I added Andy, but several people characterize that. And I should mention that um, recently with larger statistics, some people claim that perhaps there are three components. And although I am a co-author of this paper in particular, done with Alvaro Rojas, which is my former postdoc, I now came to think that I favor the hypothesis of only two components just by fitting in complementary information that became available me and while, such as kinematics and alpha over iron abundances. I would be happy to discuss that later. The fact that the relative ratio of the two components changes in space means that they must have a different special distribution. And in fact, if we reconstruct the special distribution in the sky of the two components, we see that the metal poor stars trace um, a structure that is um, fairly axisymmetric, while the metal rich stars um, trace a clear rectangle, which is the boxy structure that we expect for a bar seen edge on. But I want to emphasize here that the two components makes up more or less half and half of the total mass. So the metal poor component is not marginal with respect to the bar and the boxy peanut, et cetera, that we have been talking about so far. It is half of the thing. And now this slide is um, a bit too dense for my taste. I tend to have uh, lighter things, I apologize. But bear with me because I think that this is one of the most important points I want to make in this talk. So Christian Johnson et al, using data from the Blanco Deccan bulge surveys have demonstrated that the humanus eye color corrected for interstellar extinction correlates very well with metallicity. So we can use this color as a proxy for metallicity. And then they proceed to construct the distribution of red clump stars in a color magnitude diagram that has this color, the human I zero in the X axis and K in Y, in y axis. They construct this color magnitude diagram only for the region of the red clump in nine positions in the sky. I draw them more or less like that. What they show is that, first of all, the red clump is everywhere bimodal in color. There is a red blob and a blue blob. And that's obvious because we know that the metallicity is bimodal. And so if this color traces metallicity, it must be bimodal too. Also, we see that the red side, the metal rich stars, have a distribution like that. On the left side here, they are bright. On the right side, they are fainter, and that's okay because we know that we have a bar. In the middle, they are bimodal, and that's also okay because we know that we have a boxy peanut. However, the metal poor side, this blue blob, is everywhere in the same position. I draw some lines here to help you see that. See, the blue thing is always at the same position. Okay, so why am I surprised? This is the metal poor component that I just said that it is a spheroid. I'm not surprised indeed, but I want to make the point that all these studies that use the red clump stars to derive the parameters of the bulge are missing this thing. Because by using all these studies, they use it near infrared colors, 
in which these two blobs are merged in color. So this thing gets diluted into the red uh, blob, but they are missing half of the stuff. So I would like to ask if there is anyone here who is able to play this game, to please play this game again, isolating only the blue stars, because we need a parameterization as accurate as this for the spheroid. Although I was asked to talk only about the observations, I cannot help showing just very quickly the same two maps in the sky that I showed uh, uh, three slides uh, ago from the models, um, for instance, by the Batista in a second, you will see others. They say that you can reproduce these two, oh, sorry, these two components, one more spheroidal and another one with the bar and the boxy peanut and the thing long bar without invoking a classical bar for classical bulge for this one. In fact, you can form both of them from the disk, provided that, the, that there are two disks uh, with different uh, radial distribution. Same thing from the Francesca Fraguti and Paola Di Matteo. Um, they get a rather spheroidal distribution for the metal poor stars and uh, more elongated for the metal rich stars. Uh, if you didn't do it already, see the talk about Paola Di Matteo. She had more beautiful figures than these ones I could take from the papers. Also, a more recent paper by Francesca Fraguti showed that uh, Milky Way-like galaxies in the Auriga simulation um, formed mostly in situ. So again, the fact that we have a spheroid uh, doesn't necessarily require a classical bulge. Obviously, given that the two components have different spatial distribution, they must have different kinematics to sustain these different 3D shapes. And in fact, we see from spectra, from radio velocities, that metal poor stars rotate slightly slower than metal rich stars. Different authors find differences more or less uh, marked, but it is not huge in any case. What is more uh, different is the distribution of the um, velocity dispersion. In fact, metal poor stars tend to have a constant velocity dispersion, both in longitude and in latitude, while metal rich stars have a pretty large gradient with, of course, stars closer to the center having larger velocity dispersions. These trends are at least qualitatively, but even more or less quantitatively reproduced by models. Uh, for instance, this one by Lia Danasula et al. a few years ago, you see, they are more or less okay. So again, these models are also, also reproduce the evolution of a disk. So again, we do not require um, a classical bulge apparently. The different rotation, different rotation curve was also derived by Will Clarkson et al. from data, from HST data. They did not have spectra, and therefore, in order to separate the metal poor from the metal rich populations, they use this trick here that is very interesting, I think, to mention. They use a combination of optical and near infrared bands to construct two indices. They were originally proposed by Tom Brown uh, 10 years ago or so. These two indices are able to break the degeneracy between metallicity and temperature. And so they produce the stars in this plot um, concentrate in two blobs that are associated to the metal rich population and the metal poor population. And then uh, Will Clarkson and collaborator could construct the rotation curve by using proper motions. You see that they see that the metal rich stars, unfortunately, that the metal rich stars have a faster rotation compared to the metal poor stars. Here, the difference between the two seems to be a bit larger than what was found with spectra. And in a recent paper by Go Kelly et al, 2022, the same uh, plot that we just saw, that is this one with the 
different rotation curves. Uh, keep in mind that the metal rich one is blue here and the metal poor is red here. And that's because in the simulation, what happened is that normally uh, the, the models do not have a very good precision in metallicity. And so they use ages as a proxy for metallicity. So in the model, we don't have, um, they don't have uh, metal poor and metal rich stars. They have old and young stars. You can see that also the model predict a difference in the rotation velocity of the two components, but not so big. Apparently in the data, they are a little bit bigger. These two components also have different alpha over iron ratios. And this was shown by, by many authors, but I think the most beautiful one is this one by Kerose et al, in which they constructed the alpha over iron versus iron trend for stars in three cylinders, one centered in the galactic center and another two at larger height from the plane, reproduced here in these three plots. We see that stars in these plots um, have a bimodal distribution, very clearly bimodal. That's one of the reasons why I think there are only two components, uh, except that the metal poor component dominates far away from the plane and the metal rich component dominates closer to the plane. Same thing is seen in larger cylinders, just with the much larger statistics, of course. So it's very, very clear. Of course, the fact that there is a B modality in this plot means that the two components had a different, pretty different star formation rate when they formed. And one suggestion on how could it be, could it have happened and, and why so bimodal and not a continuum has been made by Clark et al uh, two years ago. This paper actually, um, is focused on the disk and not on the bulge, but I think that the philosophy can be the same. And also keeping in mind that our bulge apparently comes from the disk. And now getting toward uh, the second part of my talk, I will breathe and dive, put my hand in the wasp nest of the bulge age distribution. This is probably the most debated topic uh, in, in among the bulge observers, and I will do my best to be brief, but fair. What I'm showing here is a near infrared color magnitude diagram of a field in the galactic bulge observed by HST. It's one of the most beautiful color magnitude diagrams we have. It shows the main sequence, the turn off the red giant branch, and this color magnitude diagram is already decontaminated from the foreground disk by using proper motions obtained with HST. Even after the decontamination, in this region here, we have stars. And so the community is divided into groups. Some of us, including myself, think that these stars are residual from a non-perfect disk foreground decontamination and or a few blue straggler stars. Some other people think that these stars are genuine young or intermediate age stars. Of course, we all have arguments to sustain our preference. <laughs> and because the arguments are pretty respectful and strong in both cases, we do not reach an agreement yet. If I try to, to see the thing in perspective, one of the reasons that I think is at the bottom, at the core of this discrepancy is the fact that the proper motion distribution of disk stars here in blue and bulge stars here in red largely overlap. And the reason why these two population, these two distribution overlap is not our error. It is because in the intrinsic velocity dispersion of these two population is large. And so even if by magic, we would have zero error in the proper motions, we will not be able to make a cut that leaves us with a clean bulge population and a clean disk population. And because the two population mix precisely at the main sequence turn off, this is a problem that has been very hard to solve. In fact, we didn't solve it. And it has been so tough to, to reach an agreement. 
One promising, uh, in principle at least, um, solution is to forget about proper motions and to use distances from, for instance, from Gaia to decompose the disk for ground from the bulge. However, at least at the moment, this is only possible for the brighter stars because we need not really precise distances, but we need uh, reasonable distances, reasonably reasonable enough to be able to establish which ones are disk stars and should be eliminated. However, this is only possible for bright stars. In fact, it has been attempted by Asterquist 2020 for the bright RGB stars. Well, this is very promising. Uh, I, I personally think that we should um, very carefully um, quantify the systematics in this game. Because to attribute an age to RGB stars, we need to rely on stellar models. However, we should keep in mind the stellar models at super solar metallicities, that is where we are finding um, young stars, have exactly zero calibrators in the upper RGB. And so this needs really to be quantified before it can be used safely to overcome the problem of the decontamination that I mentioned before. And so a summary of what I said so far is that in our own bulge, we have two components, a metal poor one and a metal rich one. In addition of being different in metallicity, this one, the metal poor, has a spheroidal shape, while this other one is a bar plus a boxy peanut. This one rotates slower compared to this other one that rotates faster. Metal poor stars also have a constant uh, velocity dispersion, while the metal rich one show a um, pretty large gradient. Metal poor stars are high in alpha over iron ratios, while the metal rich one are low. And these ones, the metal poor, are only old. We all agree on that. While the metal rich ones are also old, but we couldn't agree yet on whether there are also some young or intermediate age stars or not. Apparently, so far, we can reproduce both, at least qualitatively, with models without invoking any classical bulge. So both formed in situ from these stars. Going to, toward the end, the organizer urged us to have some final slides on the open issues that are worth a discussion in the next few days. My attempt at, the, at that is the following. I think we lack a proper characterization of the 3D structure of the metal poor spheroid for what I showed. We have analyzed in detail the structure of the red clump stars in different directions, but we have found in this game only the bar and uh, somehow the spheroid got lost in the fitting of the, of the red clump stars, of the metal rich red clump. We also have an open issue on the age distribution of the metal rich stars. We can discuss, but I don't know if we are in a position to reach an agreement. Let's try. Also, one open point is whether the error ladies trace the same population as the metal poor red clump stars. I didn't talk about error ladies so far. So, what is this issue with the error ladies? Well, error ladies, in principle, are extremely useful for two reasons. One is that they trace a poor old population. So they gave us the opportunity to know what is the structure and what is the properties of the first thing that got into the region of the bulge. And also they are rather precise distance indicators. So they allow us to make a 3D uh, reconstruction of the shape uh, much better than red clump stars. So what do we know about them? Just the metallicity distribution of other lighters, recently derived by Savino et al., would be like that, um, overplotted in the metallicity distribution of red clump stars. 
I should mention that perhaps the systematics in the determination of the metallicity for these stars is not the same as the one of these stars. So the two may be a bit closer or a bit further away, but for sure, RLR is as much more metal poor than the red clumps stars. Now, if we look at this plot, naively, we might say they are another population uh, just for the metallicity, but this is not true, of course, because um, it might perfectly be that these two tracers um, come from the same parent population, except that only the metal poor tail of this population contains stars that burn helium in their core blue enough that they can cross the instability strip and pulsate as an RLID. So the fact that they are different in metallicity don't mean at all that they must trace to different component. However, if we reconstruct their shape and their kinematic, we can there establish whether they are the same component or not. And unfortunately, again, the community is divided between some that think that the error light is trace a spheroidal non-rotating component similar to the one of red clump stars, and some other think that they trace a possibly smaller bar similar to the metal rich red clump. Um, I've never worked on that, but I must say that I wouldn't like to be a modelist that needs to be needs to, to explain how in our galaxy we would have formed a bar before everything else, and then a spheroid, and then on top another bar. <laughs> Likely, I am an observer. Um, and so I don't have to solve that trouble. If you want to know about more about Arrelari, I suggest to go and listen to Andrea talk if you haven't done it already. And as a very final thing, uh, I would like to mention that another open um, issue is not a problem, but is like an entire field is how do the nuclear bulge and central molecular zone fit in this picture? This would deserve a completely uh, separate workshop, but I just want to mention that inside the bulge, there is uh, the nuclear bulge that is a pretty dense and massive region that contrarily to the rest of the bulge includes a lot of interstellar medium. In particular, it includes 80% of the dense gas of the Milky Way. And as such, it should include a lot of star formation, but instead it, it is not forming stars as efficiently as we would think. It, is, it includes only 10% of the Milky Way star formation. And one of the reasons why it, is wor it would be worth uh, studying this more in detail is that if we explain somehow the formation of the bulge, we should explain uh, in a coherent way also the formation of this region. But also um, another point is that the particular conditions of this gas that is dense is turbulent and it is relatively hot. Uh, apparently resembles a lot the conditions of the gas in star forming, high redshift star forming galaxies. And so if that is true, we would have um, a local analog of a star forming galaxy and that would be wonderful. So I think we should um, really, now that we have a, a camera with very high sensitivity and spatial resolution in near infrared, we should really study that um, further. And with that, I think I can conclude. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Manuela, for the very nice talk. Um, and about the point on the nuclear uh, disks, we will have uh, a nice talk on Friday by Matthias Romani, who I'm okay. sure will tell us more about this also, yes. Um, okay, great. So let's take questions from Manuela. So um, I'm going to actually start uh, with uh, two questions that we've already had on Slack, and then I'll go to uh, the participants on Zoom. So Lodo is saying, thank you, Manuela, for the nice review. Um, maybe I missed it, but is there a bimodality and a vertical gradient in the age of the stars 
that follows the same metallicity by modality, the, that also follows the metallicity by modality? Um, more or less, um, this paper, for instance, says that in this plot, they show the fraction of stars younger than five giga year. And so at different latitudes, I draw them here. So the blue one, for the blue uh, line that shows the stars closer to the plane, at high metallicity, they have a pretty large fraction of uh, stars younger than five giga year, actually more than 50%. But when we go far away from the plane to the cyan, green, and red, cyan, green, and red, the fraction of young stars um, becomes lower. So apparently, those who do find some fraction of young stars find that their number is different when we move vertically. Okay. This is all we know more or less at the moment about age gradients. Thanks. And another question uh, also from Slack comes from uh, Matthias Romani, who says, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, do we have constraints on what fraction of the bar mass comes from stars that formed after the bar formed. And uh, he says that there's evidence of currently ongoing star formation of stars on bar-like orbits. And Matthias is wondering how much of this kind of star formation has contributed over time to build up the bar as these stars would also be very much rich. Yeah, it's a complicated question issue, and uh, I think we don't have a complete answer um, that I know of. Um, although we disagree on the exact age distribution, I think we all agree that there is no ongoing star formation outside the nuclear bulge, uh, of which I didn't talk about at all. So outside the inner few hundred parsec, there is no ongoing star formation. The youngest stars, if they are there, there are two giga year old or so. That's part of the answer, I think. And another part is that something that I showed, and I'm not sure if that answer that is related to what you have in mind is this, all that we know regarding the fraction of stars in, in and out of the bar, we know that Metal poor stars seem to make up for half of the stellar mass that is there, and metal rich stars make up the other half. However, I should say that this distribution is not properly characterized in the middle because we have no points. You see, the, the line of sight for which we had point are these things. And in the middle, we really have no points. And that's part of my first open issue. We don't know how the spheroid is in the central part, whether it has a peak, a central concentration, or it is shallow, we really have not characterized that, and I think we should. Okay, I think Mattia has his hand up, but we'll first go to um, uh, Michael Rich, who also has a question. Hi, Mike. Yes, hi, Manuela. Very nice talk, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, Marchetti et al. also has a talk that gives constraints on the star fraction of stars younger than 2 billion years in the bulge um, using uh, Gaia cleaning of the color magnitude diagram. So that's presented at this meeting. Uh, then the second thing in, is um, that I think we see more of a disk orientation in the metal rich stars with stars of increasing metallicity, this is the Johnson et al. work, being closer to the plane. And then we think that the metal poor population actually begins to dominate at a brown minus 0.5 dex away from the plane. Whereas your boundary for metal poor stars in the 2017 paper was roughly to make that you know, left-hand plot was at, at solar metallicity. So we would argue that that you know even actually below minus 0.5 dex, there's not such a spheroidal distribution for the metal poor population. Okay. Thanks. Okay, and we had I think Peter Irwin had his hand up. Peter, do you still want to ask your question? Um, 
otherwise, uh, I think my, uh, Mattia had his hand up also. So Mattia, go ahead. Um, thanks. Um, thanks, Manuela, for the nice talk. Um, no, I wanted to reply to what you said about um, uh, the ongoing star formation, because it, it's true that there isn't uh, uh, evidence for uh, ongoing star formation outside the central few hundred parsecs, but uh, there is this uh, uh, large star formation complex, uh, Sagittarius E, which is yeah. uh, at two degrees from the galactic center, but the stars uh, have very uh, high line of sight velocities, so more than 200 kilometers per second. And uh, we modeled the, these uh, stars uh, and the, the gas along which they are formed with simulations. And basically, yes, now they are in the center, but because they have so high velocities, they will uh, continue flying past the center. Okay. And if you look at the orbits that they have, uh, they are X1 type orbits. So they, they will reach a few kiloparsecs from the center. So, <clears throat> and this is a pretty large star formation complex. Now I, I don't remember the numbers. And so I was thinking, uh, so this is evidence of stars that are for being formed now and that will build up the bar. And I was just wondering, okay, this seems to be a pretty um, substantial contribution, but you know, there is a lot of fluctuations. I, I was wondering if it, this is, uh, so if we take the current value and we just uh, assume it's constant, what fraction, maybe that's a big fraction or maybe it's a coincidence that we see a lot of star formation of this type right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I was wondering if there are other constraints. I don't know about them. Uh, I'm sorry, but I will look about this. Do you talk about this in your talk? I didn't manage to listen uh, to you. No, not really. My talk is on Friday, but uh, I will not talk about this. But we, we have a, um, the paper is Anderson et al. 2020. I okay. put it in the Slack um, where we, we talk about this uh, Sagittarius E complex. I think in the paper we didn't emphasize the connection with the bar, but in hindsight. Okay, but uh, now I know it and I will read it, bring this in mind. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so Matteo, and this is already in the, in the Slack. And I also saw that there was another question by Matteo, sorry, I missed it, um, asking uh, whether the bulge, Matteo, maybe you can ask your question since you are, uh, uh, wait, let me try and unmute you again. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, no, just just um, a confusion about the nomenclature that I, I, it's not very clear to me, like bulge and bar. Are they the same or do people um, all mean the same thing or some people have a distinction between them? Uh, I, I usually have a slide at the beginning of my talk that uh, just now I removed it uh, in which I clarify that I personally call bulge everything that is inside a radius of about two kiloparsec. So the name doesn't identify a specific component but just the region of the galaxy. I have the feeling that we all do more or less the same in the in the stellar community because uh, yeah so so a bar is one of the component of the bulge and a spheroid is another one. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, uh, do we have any other questions? I see that Mike has his hand up. I don't know if it's from before. Um, uh, Mike, do you have another question? No, just uh, uh, compliments again on a very nice talk. Thank you. My hand was uh, accidentally raised. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So um, again, ah, Bruce has a question. Please go ahead, Bruce. Bruce, we can't hear you. Even though you're unmuted. Is that all right? Yes, we can hear you okay. not very loudly, but yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, sorry, since um, since it was a minute, I thought I'd ask, is it possible the bar just formed, say, two giga years ago? And there are some other studies of galaxies looking at how long the existing bars can live, given the inflow rates and, and, and gas that's available. It's not very long, a couple giga years. Um, and it would have mixed up all of the stars that had formed prior to it. It would have sent some to uh, vertical heights because of the vertical resonances 
and taken a lot of the disk stars in that area into the bar just because of the way the bar, the bar works. So, so could we have had a Milky Way without a bar for quite a long time and then just have a bar recently since Z equals a half or Z equals you know, closer to one? My answer will be probably yes, but I think that this question should be asked to the modelers more than to me. Maybe Victor, De Batista, or or Francesca, if they are here, could answer better. Well, it's related to the cooling of the disk because if it's too hot, you're not going to get a bar very easily. So that's kind of related to the later thin disk epoch when the thin disk gets massive enough, I would imagine. So there's a there's a reason for bars to occur mostly at lower redshift because that's when you got enough mass in a, in a cool disk. So it seems not inconsistent. However, when, yeah. when you form a bar two giga years ago, would that be associated to some star formation? That yeah, it, or? yeah, should be a burst then. And then after that, not so much because the gas comes to the center. Then in that case, I think uh, that can be excluded because even those who find a few stars at uh, two giga years uh, old, they are just a very minor percentage. So is there so, any evidence for a starburst? No. Uh, two, so years, I don't know. two, three, four, five, any, is there a time scale? Mm. No, If okay. you say six or seven, maybe, but Victor is answering in the chat. He says, if the bar formed recently, then there would be and Victor, go ahead. You have your hand stars in the bar. Yeah, so it's the same thing that I just yeah. said. Maybe. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, we had a paper where we looked at uh, a cosmological simulation from the fire suite a couple of years back, the Batista Tal 2019, probably, uh, where we looked at precisely a, a galaxy that formed a bar uh very recently and very recently within the past three four giga years and what ended up happening is we ended up scattering a lot of stars to large latitudes uh much more than is observed i think much more than is observed uh and so we think that that wasn't consistent with what we're observing in the in the milky way so that's the constraint yeah there's also a recent paper by shola wiley from orton gerhardt's uh, group showing that if you try and age state the bar using the inner ring of the bar, it also is consistent with an older bar of at least seven giga years old. So I think there's different lines of evidence pointing to an old bar in the Milky Way, as okay. Victor was saying. Thanks. Okay, I think we should move on now because where our time is up. So thank you very much again, uh, Manuela, for this uh, great review. Thank you to all the speakers today for these great review talks. So I think we've now set the stage really nicely from all of these four different communities about where, where we are in terms of knowledge formation from high red shifts, extragalactic simulations, and the Milky Way. And um, we have a lot of great contributed talks. So um, even though there are no live sessions tomorrow, tomorrow your homework is <laughs> watching all the great contributed talks that we have and coming up with questions in the Slack um, and for the discussion sessions that are going to take place on Wednesday. And also don't forget that on Wednesday, we have more um, invited uh, live uh, talks from our invited speakers as well, who are going to touch upon a lot of the different questions and topics that were raised um, today. So I think that's all I had to say. Yes, and we will convene on Wednesday, 9 a.m. Central European Summertime. Um, so see you, see you then. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Great talks. Bye.